This is the first top 11 video I've ever made. I felt like doing one for Welcome to Night Vale, even though I've never done a top whatever list, because it's a great show that I enjoy a lot. But also, I wanted to take on the challenge of making a good top 11 video about an audio-only show. It was too tempting. Though I might be coming in blasphemy because I'm making this list on a mountain right now. This is easily one of my favorite shows. Not only is there consistently creative and interesting storytelling, but it also keeps progressive writing in mind more so than almost any other show I can think of. The show features good subversion of supernatural and horror tropes, and it does a great job of mixing comedy and satire with scary and imaginative scenarios told with effective use of audio effects. It's a brilliant example of what can be done in an audio show that can't be done with video and what can be done with a low budget that seems irrelevant to the quality. I'll give a spoiler warning now. I will try to not give major spoilers when I describe episodes, but there's only so much I can do. I'm sure I will still spoil many things. I can't promise I will give less spoilers than you can tolerate. If you haven't listened to or if you haven't listened to some of the episodes. I would still be angry now thinking about this list if someone made it and I saw it before listening to Welcome to Night Vale. I'm spoiling some things to allow me to talk more about the episodes. For clarification, I have only considered the first 56 episodes of the main show because those are the only episodes that have been released before I finished this list. All episodes up to this point are eligible. This includes the first bonus episode of November 2014. This does not include the second episode from November 2014 because that bonus episode will be released in a couple days from now after uploading it, instantly making the list seem dated, but I knew what I was getting myself into, so I don't mind that. I mean, it's released every couple, every couple weeks. It's gonna become dated. <laughs> this also includes the live shows officially available online. I'm including those in consideration. That includes the condos, the debate, and the crossover with the Thrill and Adventure Hour. Those are eligible too. I have not taken the opening and closing proverbs into account when ranking these episodes, and this also includes the music played during the weather segments. I think these portions of the episodes are too different from the rest of the episodes to factor into why I find some episodes more enjoyable than others. When I picked my list of what I think are the 11 best episodes of Welcome to Night Vale, I tried my best to remove nostalgic bias. In other words, episodes won't make it on the list because they introduced a memorable character or featured a serious change in moment. These episodes made it on the list just because I think they are the best episodes in terms of quality, acting, dialogue, and other narrative elements. Favorite characters made their mark because they had great moments and this list will reflect that. I should note, the competition was stiff, and because of how good this show is. Even classics such as Glow Cloud, Condos, and Sandstorm didn't make the cut. This list was hard to put together, but I'm confident in my choices. I decided to go beyond the 10 episodes and instead use the top 11 format because I knew after listening to every episode again that I couldn't handle number 11 not getting mentioned just because it barely failed to make the cut. I wanted to go even further after I picked number 11, but I have to draw the line somewhere. I only plan to do 11 before I pick which episodes would make it on the list. While I am saying these are the best episodes so far, this is only my opinion, and I welcome other people to politely give their own opinions on which episodes they think are best or are their favorites. And here it is. My list of the 11 Welcome to Nightville episodes that I think added the most to the show in order with the best episode last at number one. Enjoy. Number 11. Homecoming. This was one of those episodes that I ended up liking more than I thought I was going to in the beginning. The start and premise was good. 
and I had wondered for a couple months when they would do a Homecoming episode because schools rarely come up in the show. But it seemed like, okay, another event thing, but with anything, it's not the basic idea that works. The idea has to be built upon in an interesting way, and Homecoming keeps getting better every time the main plot is brought up. When Cecil tells more about what people are doing Homecoming, the scene shows that something is on the line that is integral to Cecil's life, especially considering that going to Homecoming can reveal more about Cecil's cassette tapes. And each time more info is given about Homecoming, it just gets worse and worse, pulling the listener in, hoping that Cecil's plans don't get ruined. Cecil Baldwin gives a good performance with the right amount of subtlety to make us emotions and hope seem genuine, which helps highlight the danger of potentially losing Homecoming. And the way Homecoming is threatened is through a problem that seems weird enough to fit Welcome to Night Vale without overdoing it and seem like the writers were trying too hard. Along with that, the dramatic moments are spread out and made more palatable with good comic relief, like Nazar al-Mujahid's tattoo, the Staples ad. One of the best parts of the episode was when Earl Harlan is on the show. And while I talk about Earl Harlan's segment, I will present random images that have absolutely no connection with what I'm talking about. I honestly didn't know it was Will Wheaton until I heard the credits because I'm used to seeing him as like, Hey guys, I'm Will Wheaton from the internet when he's hosting or something like that. Here, he brings a host attitude, but it's not him. His performance is solid, fit in the character well by making Earl fit in nicely with Night Vale. There is a certain smooth inflection that feels like what I would hear on a cooking show that is nowhere near Guy Fieri. It feels widely approachable and informative like I expect a step-by-step cooking show to be. And Earl also has the friendly personality that seems refined in the delivery to make it how I just described it. Most importantly, this delivery works well with the show creating deadpan humor out of the dialogue. Like this. looks easy. It is. And also, there's this good moment when he gets into it. They'll want to never stop making tiramisu. Ooh, sounds good. Never stop making it. They'll lose their minds making it, Cecil. The dialogue for Seed of the Tiramisu Megan is even better by sprinkling interesting details about Cecil's life in the right order and speed. This makes the story creepier showing how little Cecil remembers, and how little he thinks about his past as he changes the subject. What year was that? Cecil, what year did we graduate? You don't remember, do you, Cecil? So! Earl's talking about aging, and the way the dialogue goes adds a casual tone to it, making it feel real and... The awkward silence makes it sound extra scary. The inevitability and power of the aging process in Night Vale makes me almost too creeped out to want to know more. But of course, the lack of information only sends my mind going as I wonder and hope to find out soon. Arguably the best part for me was the end when Cecil describes talking to Molly Carrera. The evidence against Herrera provided earlier in the episode sounds too ridiculous to call proof, albeit expected. But the idea of an imaginary football player created by a Nightfell football headcanon is developed in a clever and deep way. The idea combined with the final scene gives a lot of potential for people to read into the story deeply. It could get interpreted as a meta take on Nightfell headcanon or any headcanon. It could represent the unfair position of being forced to do what other people want of you while being unable to feel a sense of heaven and identity. Regardless of what meaning someone could add, it still is a fully realized idea that takes into account and shows what it would be like if someone had to live as just a figment of imagination. And the get-together towards the end also adds some nice bittersweet closure. Complete with a bleak yet satisfying cut-off point, it's an interesting end that doesn't waste the potential of a great idea. Number 10. Thrill and Adventure Hour and Welcome to Night Vale crossover. Yes, the crossover made it onto this list. 
Crossovers are generally overblown hype machines that deliver more fan service than try to form an interesting or entertaining story. And they usually don't do a good job of merging all worlds. The crossover made it onto this list because it defied that. It's just really good. Someone could argue that this is cheating a bit for this list because Fink and Craner probably only had to do half while the other writers did the Sparks Nevada material. But even if I only counted the Welcome to Nightville moments and dialogue, it would still get on this list, and I'm sure it's hard to coordinate with a different team of writers with their own ideas. So I approach ranking this by counting the whole 90 minutes. And whether or not the Welcome to Nightville parts were good, it would be hard to appreciate with terrible Sparks Nevada scenes. And the Sparks Nevada parts are great. I'm sure the crossover was great without resorting to fan service, because I never heard of the Thrill and Adventure Hour until I heard this was going to happen. And I never listened to the show before this crossover. I instantly got engaged with Sparks Nevada, and I really liked the characters who grew on me instantly. I am from Galoot Proctor. Just call it. Just call it, Mars. You designated Just call it, Mars. Not during the crossover. The Onus jokes were always or mostly good, happening at the right times to keep them from getting old. And the whole cast worked well in this adventure. Hour. And one of the best things about the crossover is how well it meshed Welcome to Night Vale with Thrill and Adventure Hour. I can only think of one or maybe two other crossover stories that feel so well woven into each other that they appear to me as one new show and while being entertaining in its own way. This is something that more crossovers should strive for. I felt like they were in the same world and never questioned it despite both of them clearly appearing as unique fully realized worlds that didn't consider the other one existent before in their series. I think this moment sums up how well their worlds meshed. I am from Galut Proctor. I don't know what that is. You designated Mars. Nope, still does not ring a bell. The timing and order of the acts was a good choice. Fleshing out the Sparks Nevada area of the story helped set up context while still not making it clear where it was going to go other than it would obviously involve Night Vale. And the festival seems very much like something Night Vale would participate in. While it seemed a bit slow in the beginning of that part, it soon picked up steam with great moments like when Cecil told people what to bring to the festival. Bring your children to the festival. Or, if you do not have children, to bring someone else's children. Deb's return. How are things going with the moon? Oh, you know, I'm glad you asked. We have been trying and trying. I don't care. To... Okay. The funny lines kept coming and continued to create the same feel of the show as Cecil explained people's attempts to destroy the moon. And the good jokes continued to remind me of why I like these characters in the first place, while helping me love the Sparks Nevada characters. The way the crossover helped display the relationship between Nevada and Croach. 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 Uh, the way their relationship was expressed was touching and funny, including moments showing Sparks Nevada's reluctance to be nice and validate their friendship. Among the Welcome to Nightville characters, Steve had great moments whether it came to the weather segment or the scene where everyone showed their disliking of him. Yeah, shut up, Steve Carlsberg. <laughs> nobody asked you and nobody ever will. I possess no affection for the human designated Steve Carlsberg. And Carlos had many good moments, though I think most of them can't compare to this adorable gem. I tell him he looks like a baby boomer mall mom on a cruise vacation. The crossover did include references to past Welcome to Nightville episodes, but most of the time they felt like past details that get brought up like they usually do. There was one reference to the Numbers episode, which was nicely sneaked in without the episode feeling bogged down by trying too hard to make fan survey references for the sake of it. <coughs> Simpsons. <coughs> Family Guy. <coughs> And this Carlos moment was placed at exactly the right time, in my opinion. Human, your teeth and hair are the finest teeth and hair I have ever encountered. One of my favorite parts about the crossover 
is a scene that clearly exposes how insulting it is to focus on someone's looks without focusing on chosen important qualities in a person. And the scene soon points out the lack of consent and pressuring people into saying yes. And the scene includes a very satisfying response to the question. It shows that even in a crossover, the Welcome to Night Vale crew will still participate in projects that give strong, benevolent, and rarely expressed messages. There was also a nice pop culture homage at the end that fit in nicely with familiar events in the story, and Joseph thinks if that was him and not an imposter. His introduction at the beginning was nice, an amusing way to help the story fit into people's canon. And the story did, for the most part, fit nicely. Clearly, a lot of love and care went into this episode, proving that it wasn't a cheap gimmick. It might not be higher on the list, but like other episodes on this list, the crossover handled itself well to show that Welcome to Night Vale could take on any new challenge to take the show even further. Now, if only they could do a crossover with Bill Nye and Neil deGrasse Tyson trying to get back out of Night Vale with Carlos's help, I'm hoping. I still have faith. Make it happen. That's not a ridiculous request, right? Number 9. September Monologues Like a story about you, this episode benefits from a lack of interruptions in the stories. It does something different that works well too. For one, this episode rarely has Cecil in it, and he does a fine job with some interest in dialogue, but it's not what makes this episode great. All three actors perform well with their monologues adding to the already compelling stories. The monologue format as a focused, random, incidental style that makes the stories feel more genuine and immersive in a slice of life way. Each monologue does a good job of focusing on the character telling it, and there's a pace that feels rushed in a good way. Not because it doesn't tell enough, but because it tells a lot, and it's almost always satisfying. To start, the faceless old woman who secretly lives in your home probably has her most interesting moments in the entire show in her monologue. Previous faceless old woman monologues have done a good job of being entertaining or creepy. But this is the first time for me that she didn't feel like she was just a run-in joke and appeared as a deep character. And while I talk about the first monologue, I will present random background images for absolutely no specific reason. She still appears eerie, but her lonely side is well expressed as she talks about how out of touch she feels with Chad, who she watches in his home. Crying without making a sound or moving. A silence of tears down your slack, boyish face. Chad, this is you, and I'm trying to understand. And What's with all the candles? Your room is strewn with clothes like your dresser got sick from overeating, but suddenly you're buying nicely scented candles and arranging them carefully in the living room? That doesn't seem like you, Chad. And some bits manage to scare me in a way that gets discharged into laughter. Like... And I tell them where to lay their eggs. So listen, Chad, do not get on my wrong side. My fury is vast and murky and expressed through a papier-mâché gape mouth figure that I left behind your cereal boxes this morning. Mara Wilson's approach has just enough a tiny bit of feeling in her speech that it sucks me in from the start like she never did before. The last couple sentences cement the mood and theme of the monologue to make it worth more than the sum of its parts. Michelle's monologue afterward is placed at a perfect time because I don't think I could have handled the weight of the third monologue after the dark style of the first one. Michelle's comic relief is a great palate cleanser that reminded me again that Fink and Craner aren't just good with horror and drama. At least, for me, Michelle was never mentioned or appeared in the show prior, and I didn't care because Kate Jones hits it out of the park quickly, and her character is a great satire of the worst kind of hipster. She has moments like... Folk music is over. It's done. Came and went. Stop listening to folk music. The Guthrie replicas are now 70% off. Please don't buy them, though. Folk music is dead. Her intense behavior keep the scene from ever getting born. And how can I not bring up? And then I told him the store was closed and he wasn't allowed to leave. He's still somewhere in the basement. A couple people came looking for him, but I covered my eyes with my hand and sat silently so they couldn't see me. The best thing about Michelle for me is that she isn't chained down. 
to just be in a hipster parody, and the writers just threw in whatever they could to make her stand out as an interesting and entertaining character that could keep surprising me while still making it fit well. And this might be my favorite Michelle moment. I've been selling her blank CDs for years now and telling her that's Panic at the Disco's aesthetic, that they just released completely silent songs with no titles on albums with no tracks or cover art and no name. It's really funny. Except for their new album really did come out and it's called Quit Fabricating Our Musical Career, Michelle. So I'm a little freaked out by that. While I love the other two, I think Steve Carlsberg's monologue might be my favorite. Like the first monologue, it fleshes out the character more by building on previous moments. There are interesting random character bits that show him as a simple person, though the last monologue paints a bleak image of Steve's lonely life and the price he has to pay for being the one who can see and explain conspiracies that no one else wants him to admit. As a feminist myself, who is quote unquote out to ruin everyone's fun, and is often scared of speaking up, I can relate to Steve's monologue the most. I don't know. Maybe he's right. It's not like knowing has made my life easier. Quite the opposite. When he talks about Cecil, he doesn't say much about who he is talking about. However, the details make it immediately clear. He shows a side that seems to accept Cecil's hate towards him, but isn't happy with it either. The origin story of Cecil's one-sided feud with Steve shows a sad side to many otherwise funny Steve Carlsberg moments. Of course, I laughed at anti Steve jokes after this episode, but it saddened him during this monologue. And one fun comic relief moment makes the story easier to take in somehow without distracting too much. We chatted for a while. I don't remember what about. Maybe the weather. No, definitely the weather. I remember it was the weather because we had to stand in awkward silence for a bit as we waited for the music to stop playing. That's one extra thing that makes the episode nice. No other episode apart from the crossover has bucked the weather segment. Fortunately, it hasn't been done much to lessen the impact of removing it. What makes the last monologue especially sad is when Steve talks about his love for his wife and stepdaughter as his own family. It was great to see in Old Oak Doors, but here there is a desperation in Hal Lublin's performance, along with a script that intensifies for me Steve's expression of love and care while admitting what he is willing to sacrifice to help. I have nothing else to say. September Monologues is dead. The end. There are no good episodes. Not anymore. Stop listening to September Monologues. Why do people like September Monologues? What's so great about Welcome to Nightville? Stop watching this list. The show is over. Number eight. N number eight. Nah, nah, uh, tiger. Fire. Dancing through the fire. Walk. This is weird because I didn't remember this episode being great until I listened to it again. I'm more grateful for making this list partly because it helped me realize how much this episode has to offer. The 30th episode, Dana, was a good episode, but as great as Dana's moments were, with Jessica Nicole giving a powerful performance, it was only the Dana moments that stood out to me without much else supporting the episode. Walk has this and the Dana moments are the best I have so far heard in the series. I believe Jessica Nicole had more to work with in Walk than in Dana, and she didn't waste any of that potential. The first great thing about Walk is that it lets Dana take the episode like almost no one else has. The episode isn't called Dana, it's called Walk. Each title, except for the pilot, references the Night Vale Monster of the Week, or the main theme, which is the Walk signals that appear around a night veil forcing people to mindlessly walk. But Dana takes up most of the episode, talking about her experiences in another dimension. Cecil isn't describing this. Dana narrates it herself. On top of that, the dialogue along with Nicole's performance fleshes out her character, showing how she is strong. I'm afraid? No, concerned. No, afraid. It would have been the easy choice to make Dana a powerful, aggressive, badass who will fight her way out of problems with physical violence. 
But we already have Tamika. Tamika's great. Tamika can always be Tamika. Dana paints a more relatable tale about being a young person who will survive and be tough just because she has to in order to survive, and feels scared and lost the entire time just moving forward because, again, she has to in order to survive. That's a tale that doesn't get told enough. I must find a way back to you, listeners. I must protect Night Vale, and Cecil, and my mother, and my brother, and whoever I am. I must protect them from what is coming. And this isn't the typical normal guy who enters in without experience and ends up being the most awesome. This is a young, timid woman who is lonely and stranded, pressing against improbable odds. I don't have to keep trying. There is no obligation for me to not just give up, just slump down until I fall away and join the inanimate matter of this strange other world. I don't have to keep trying. Remember that, I say to myself, as I keep trying. As I said, this episode had support elsewhere, and there were really funny moments, like the description about Thursday, and a believable story about the city council. When reached for comment, the city council said that they were definitely at City Hall, ready to receive the concerns of their constituents, and not, say, hiding in a hastily dug hole in Mission Grove Park. As I also said, the problem in this episode was the walk signals, and the writers do a pretty good job of making it feel like there's a real problem we rarely hear anything about because Dana keeps taking over the episode. The walk problem is interesting, which only makes the resolution at the end more enjoyable. I think this moment shows how much effort was put into the walk framework. And so, before I go, I take you to the walk thir- The walk thir- the walk. 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 A hard challenge with the lack of time to tell the walk story and the need to carefully edit the episode to feel like we're always missing something in Cecil's show. But the fun random moments and the outside walk story never distract from the main point of the episode, which really is Dana. They instead add to the immersion, making it feel like there's a larger world around Dana's scary adventures while keeping the focus very much on how she feels and what she does with mostly showing and not telling. I think the last moments with Dana, after the weather, do the best job of giving her character depth while tugging at my heartstrings. Like, for example, I have these memories, but memories prove nothing. Experiences also prove nothing. There are many proofs for nothing. It is the concept of which we are most certain. I'm sorry. I'm trying to remember something important and I am failing. Dana's bit about looking from another perspective and many other lines are great too. If she didn't constantly have interest in or insightful moments of dialogue, this episode wouldn't have been on the list. And the last scene with Cecil not only has a sweet moment with him talking about Carlos, but it's also a big slap in the face to anyone who cared about the walk story. Combined with the rest of the episode, this slap in the face is a great punchline to the episode that's just plain awesome. It's done in the best way possible, and it subtly points out the formula or trope in most episode endings. With this, and moments that easily make Dana one of my favorite characters, the writers and Jessica Nicole got walk onto this list. And Cecil Baldwin too. Sorry, Cecil. <laughs> Besides, I have many good opportunities to gush about you on this list. Don't worry. People could probably make a drinking game out of how much I compliment your acting. Number seven. A story about you. This episode seems less weird now compared to later episodes, but it was a big risk. One notable thing about the episode that helps it get this high on the list is that like others, it's the first of its kind. The pilot had no chance of getting on this list because, naturally, it took time for Fink, Craner, and Baldwin to refine the episodes. They didn't need to do so with this new format. On top of that, the new format is used well enough that, in some ways, it's better than the norm. Random distractions like traffic and children's fun fact science corner that are used to fill up time are absent. Only the weather is here, and even that is smoothly brought up and placed in the episode. This way, the episode can go from scene to scene at a safe pace that allows the plot to flourish. 
this is still the only episode that made heavy use of second person narration. But it took more than a tool to make this episode great. It's how the tool is used. Cecil's delivery finds a good middle ground throughout the story helping each line seem memorable with an easy to follow pace. A Story About Them is a great episode too in its own way, but I think A Story About You is a lot more immersive in comparison because of how it used second person narrative compared to A Story About Them's use of third person narrative. I love how A Story About You plays with the fear of thinking that the universe has no laws. And for no other reason than that you are trapped by the freedom to do anything in this life, you took one of the crates. The plot is so simple, but it never loses sight of the point of the story, constantly given the impression that every scene is important. Even the moment in the diner. The diner scene is a nice break, while helping to add moments that smoothly remind the listener of the implied theme of the episode. You do not pull the hand away because you know that there will be no consequence for any of this. There are even occasional amusing moments like, you did not order invisible pie. You hate invisible pie. And the episode plays with the meta nature of the story without overdoing it. How did you find me? You ask. Everything you do is being broadcast on the radio for some reason. That made it pretty easy. When the episode comes together around the final moments, it gives me a sense of satisfaction to see, oh, this is how things really are. And I feel the same way the protagonist does to an extent. All at once you are no longer free. It's all coming back around, all at once. It's when the pieces of plot come together that they equal more than the sum of its parts. And the very end is a good example of how incomplete endings can be a more fitting end than complete ones. Enough details are left to make it clear what happens to the protagonist at the end, but it ends soon enough that it feels a bit more ambiguous, enhancing the uncomfortable feelings of the last minute or so. Cecil's words after the story pulled me out of the story enough to make it all seem like just another incidental random thing. His brief description puts it all in perspective because of how deep the narrative goes into this one little story about a weird force in the sky and this worker breaking off on his own multiple times. I don't know how to end this description, so I'll take a cue from a story about you and just end it here. Number 6. Company Picnic. This was close to being number 7, but after listening to them another time, I couldn't justify placing Company Picnic below number 6 with the creepiness and frequency of great dialogue in this episode, even if a story about you is great in its own way. Lauren Sharp gives a good performance and Kevin R. Free's act as the wolf in sheep's clothing is almost too accurate at recreating people who are only nice on the outside. Kevin shows his bad side just enough times to make him creepy then, and even creepier when he appears completely nice. The sandstorm was great the way it was. The one key difference in the sandstorm is that other than the dialogue being typical capitalist rhetoric about productivity and value, Kevin was only allowed to otherwise appear charming. I think this line does a good job of summarizing familiar misplaced designations of value that are depicted in Company Picnic. What value are you adding to the world? What are you worth? Those are the questions you should ask yourself. And don't worry if you forget to ask yourself. There will be people with clipboards who will come by soon to ask them for you. Here, Kevin is revealed just a tiny bit more. With many moments of him speaking with a briefly negative tone, he shows how he hates people while he tries to hide it and seem friendly. Any more would have been an easy choice. But Fink and Craner stayed subtle, and Kevin the actor adds a lot of life in ways that only he can which I think is the more accurate method of depicting a regularly abusive person. Can I call you Kev? <laughs> no, Lauren. By no means. The dialogue is very repetitive, but it needs to be here. It emphasizes the brainwashing nature of Lauren and Kevin's propaganda. The whole episode feels like an all-encompassing trap that is present in early scenes, while progressions like this make it far more unsettling. The company picnic will be continuing on indefinitely. That the party is so good that they just couldn't bring themselves to end it. And also, people are touching the volleyball nets, which they should not do, but they're learning. 
or not them, other people watching them are learning. There are many powerful moments that walk the line between satire and a bleak depiction of unjust work environments. The way Kevin and Lauren speak to the citizens with forceful instructions had a duality, so that when euphemisms and coded language happen, there's clearly more going on than said. Fink and Craner's style works well because of how they include just enough information to tell the story while even a lot unexplained to add mystery that sometimes makes episodes more eerie. Here the dialogue goes from vague to obvious lines, which made me even more scared of what I could not know about while I imagined the worst parts of the Industrial Revolution. Renovations also continue this and it was a pretty good episode, but it ended with a hopeful scene. This episode ends with heavy implications of more of Strex Corp's dominance in the future, which enhances the bleakness of the whole episode. The episode never lets up apart from the weather, and it keeps making the situation seem worse with each minute. Sometimes the details have happened for a while before they get revealed, which heightens the emotional impact. Like earlier episodes on this list, Company Picnic style can't compete with the higher ranked episodes, but no episode before or since could accomplish what Company Picnic did, and the opportunity was used excellently. Number 5 Parade Day. I said that Fink and Craner did a good job of using second person narrative in a story about you to draw the listener in. But even with it being a great episode, something about it never pulled me in far enough to make me feel like I was actually in Night Vale. Don't get me wrong, a story about you was very immersive, and it's hard to tell a story so well that it surrounds the audience with the setting. Even video games generally don't make me literally feel like I'm there. Parade Day somehow managed to accomplish that improbable task, and without more than half of the episode devoted to the Parade Day. Like any other episode on this list, Payson is great. From the beginning, Cecil builds up the hype, given the first of some of his most powerful speeches. And later, he continues carrying the excitement when he reveals that a revolution is starting, which is what his secret messages meant. The episode's dramatic scenes also wrap around humorous moments in very natural ways that only built up the passion that comes from believing this is the time when everything gets fixed and it is glorious. I am barricading my door from the Strex-owned station management while making faces at Daniel, trapped in the booth. Also, there are other funny moments like waving her hand lazily in the air as if to shoo away a very slow bee. Reporters then noticed a very slow bee spiraling sluggishly but recklessly away from the scene. This is the first time the show painted a picture of an epic fight while being just as interesting as you'd expect. The show even uses comic relief well around the end, which is especially hard considering how quick it happens after an especially sad and insane. When I said this episode is unimaginably immersive, I also meant that it made me feel like the lowest form of scum. In a good way, because I felt like an actual Night Vale citizen who could not make a difference in the story. I felt terrible guilt when I heard about the outcome towards the end. The quote that Tamika gives also worsened the emotional blow. I won't say too much, but I could feel Cecil Palmer himself telling me things weren't better because I didn't do anything. Like Company Picnic, this episode also had a bleak ending, which only enhanced the feelings that lingered after the end of this episode. Sure, it's nice to feel great from a story, but every so often it's refreshing or emotionally cathartic to experience painful scenes, and this episode told its tale exceptionally well. Number 4 Cassette like comedy, horror is one of the hardest kinds of stories to do well, and for the same reason. People often have to use surprise as a crutch, but it's hard to find a story that is creepy and startling as much, if not more so, than the previous time enjoying it. Cassette is that horror experience for me, and it's extremely rare for me. The first time I listened to the episode, an unsettling feeling lingered with me after the episode. It even sat with me whenever I randomly thought about it. Even Silent Hill didn't do that to me to the extent that Cassette did. Suspense is the key. 
The subtle changes to the audio add to the tension as I wait for more to happen each time. When the plot advanced to the inevitable final bit, I started to see it coming. But because of that, I got so pulled in that the sound of the tape stopping gave me a nice shock. I could feel my nerves getting more sensitive as I waited for the end of the last tape. It reminded me of the Christmas episode of Adventure Time, but instead with even more weight than the Christmas episode. I knew there was going to be some weird thing. I figured as much I would tie into how Cecil is in the present, as he listens to his past self that he can't remember. But the predictability never got in the way because Fink and Craner carefully paced it out and added in the right words to build up suspense, making it increasingly obvious how this creepy origin story was going to end. I had an easy time following the story. The progression of every factor in this origin story built on the predictability of it. What made this even more disturbing was present-day Cecil's commentary, along with Baldwin's performance. Something about Cecil not having a clue about important life details only made this more eerie as more plot points drew me in. Every detail was placed at the right time to not only build on the plot, but also to add enough information to get something new when I returned to it. Even back to the first tape. Wait, what is that? Huh. It went away when I hit stop. Oh, but now it's back again. Hooray Day and a story about you got on this list because of their abilities to suck me in. But Cassette nearly perfected this in ways that they can't compare to. The intern bit in this episode is one of the funniest ones I can think of with a great segue into it too. Jesus never returned from investigating the bottomless pit in the intern break room. To the family members and loved ones of intern Jesus. Oh well, you know the usual. The comic relief came at a nice time considering how on edge I was by then and it still did not get in the way of the later tapes with the last one being the hardest one to get through. Cecil Baldwin's performance as young Cecil really made this episode as much as anything else did. Not just the voice. His personality is distinctly different from the adult Cecil. But it feels enough like him to make it easy to believe that this was Cecil back in the day. Wow, is that what I really sound like? It also contrasts the creepy directing of the cassette scenes to enhance them. I wish whatever it is would just say hi. <gasps> Whoa. I felt something touch me. I think maybe making these tapes is encouraging it. And adult Cecil's uncomfortable response helps too. Um, listeners, let's just go to the weather, okay? One thing I should warn about is that this episode is finely tuned enough that this has to be listened to without ever stopping during a cassette scene. The pace of this episode loses a lot more of its effect with interruptions. It doesn't ruin the episode, but it had significantly more weight when nothing got in the way of a cassette scene, especially the final cassette scene. Number 3 One year later I didn't expect this episode to get on this list at all. And I instead assumed that Condos and Phone Call would be here instead. Why did this episode make it so high on the list while the other two didn't? When it comes to whole episodes, no other episode did as good of a job of showing the bond between Cecil and Carlos. Carlos's monologue at the end of Old Oak Doors did it better in some ways. But from beginning to end, one year later encapsulates everything I love about Cecilos. Did I say that right? Payson from beginning to end is spot on, never missing a beat. Welcome to Night Vale is rarely this much of an emotional roller coaster. The comic relief happens at exactly the right time, without happening too soon. The comedy is gold before serious drama happens, never feeling like it's overseeing its welcome. And a lot of that is owed to Cecil Baldwin's delivery, as well as Fank and Craner. Like, there's the moment between Teddy Williams and Carlos. There's this gem. There is no conclusive evidence that this is the same airliner last seen in the Nightvale Elementary Gym one year ago. But we have jumped to that conclusion and will defend it against all naysayers, violently and without mercy. NRA satire. And 
If you say guns kill people one more time, I will shoot you with a gun, and you will, coincidentally, die. The tips about children and the scrublands and sand wastes. There is even a good line about how the Apache tracker is still a jerk. But the main point of the episode is still Cecil and Carlos's connection, not detracting away from it any more than necessary to keep the episode interesting. This episode might be the best example of Cecil Baldwin's range of acting. It's the only time this show ever made me cry, even after already listening to it before. Just listen to this contrast. I am holding the trophy. And now the second clip. I am still holding this trophy. And the way the episode progresses is likely to keep any fan on the edge of their seat. Though the final scene also might be one of the best romance scenes in the series. The easy choice would have been to overhype the romance and make this the ultimate parent from the start as if this was a Disney movie. But Fink and Craner kept it simple, making it nothing but the very beginning of a romance. Just two people loving each other's company. It doesn't have to be any more to be special. It doesn't fall into the common pitfall of making the show all about there being a gay relationship and that's it. Carlos's words when he sees Cecil in this scene hit me harder than almost any other romantic line. In anything. The last scene painted a relaxing image and Cecil Baldwin continued to never miss a beat, giving me all I could ever ask for when it comes to romance of any kind. Straight romantic stories could learn a lot from this episode. Number two, Old Oak Doors. Yes, this one got very high on the list. But there's good reason why this episode is so fondly remembered by the fans. It has so many great moments. Any of these moments would make an episode memorable on their own. And they happen almost every few minutes with a bunch of interesting or funny moments sandwiched in them. Condos and the debate didn't get on this list because while they have some of my favorite moments, Fink and Craner went into new territory with the live show episode format, and it took a couple times to refine it down to near perfection. And the crossover got intense during a couple of serious scenes, but it was more acute and fun than grip and drama, and that isn't bad. It got on the list because the plot was well formed together, and interesting while frequently being funny, but in my opinion, Old Oak Doors is more powerful with its comedy while having a lot more emotional weight. There is some humor, some drama, anything a fan could want. There was a Whole Foods ad. Whole Foods serves only the freshest food, and we certainly do not keep venomous snakes under the fruit in our produce section. Why would we? That would be dangerous and not good for business. No one has died of a snake bite at Whole Foods. No one you know. The moments of citizens fighting back, Tamika and Dana trying to speak over each other, Kevin talking about his grandmother. If it was just a bunch of characters returning, this episode wouldn't have gone on the list. But each character has great lines to work off of, and the whole cast hits him out of the park. As much as normal, if not better. Like Hiram McDaniels. Sure, just lump us all together as the other three. It's always just gold talking away like he's the most important one, and sometimes green yells something, green and gold, green and gold. Also, please call me Violet. You always say purple, but I prefer violet! To make a flan. Lady, I've trained for months. I've taken down your helicopters with only a slingshot. I've looked at a librarian right in the area where most creatures would have eyes. You do not scare me. This was my first time here in Symphony Sanders, and she has great delivery. There is passion in her words that doesn't ever feel like overcompensation allow me to easily believe this is THE Tamika Flynn. And along with her, there are great Lauren and Kevin moments as well. I'm pretty sure it's implied that hard work is part of it, Kevin. I'm pretty sure I didn't ask for your feedback. Maureen calling out Cecil. I got you coffee, and I made mimeographs, and I sang sea shanties to the ants every single day. I even copy edited your Jaws slash fic, even though that wasn't in the job description. And Cecil's carelessness after that. Steve Carlsberg doing Cecil's impression stick. But really, I was thinking about what your boyfriend Carlos said. Don't you dare, Steve Carlsberg. So, he said, I'm certain I can stop the light from entering Night Vale. I have a simple device that will protect us. 
I am not dating a munchkin from the Wizard of Oz. There are too many great moments to list here. On top of all that, the episode still finds room for an anti-Asianism line. Looking for a certain little girl. No. A young woman. No. A human being. And an anti-ableism moment after Kevin talks about supposedly fixing Janice's inability to walk. The episode does a better job than most others of building the epic image of a large-scale battle with everyone's freedoms on the line. Cecil Baldwin gives a great performance from start to finish, but I think his best moment in the episode is when he gives a speech to the town. We will work no longer. We will worship a smiling god no longer. We have failed before. We have failed so many times at so many tasks, but at this, we will not fail. And? I mean, I really, really hope that we will not fail. Combined with all that, what got this episode above one year later is the heartfelt message following the foreshadowing about Carlos being an outsider. I won't say much, but Carlos says words about what he did and where he is around the end of the episode that perfectly shows his love for Cecil and the love for science that his character encapsulates. It's a saddened scene while containing some bittersweetness before a funny moment breaks up the tension to end it in a somewhat comforting way. Which is clearly not an easy task. If the utterance of I love you ever felt powerful in this show, it's in that scene. And I will say it here. Dylan Marin is a perfect fit as the imperfect Carlos and was always will be the right choice. And lest we forget. You are a hero. I'm not a hero. I'm a scientist. All of this was done before in some way, but Old Oak Doors took what was learned and put it all together into one great celebration for the series, while leaving it open to continue the story and refine it even further. Number one, station management. Some might wonder right now, why this one? Sure, it was a good episode, but why number one? Well, it's creepier than most episodes that exist today, and it has some of the best comedic consistency among any episode. And all that was done only two episodes after the pilot. Putting these 11 episodes in order was hard, and omitting episodes from this list was hard for three dozen episodes. This is because writing along with acting and direction are great. When I decided which episode would be best, I thought, where did all of this talent start? The pilot was never considered for this list for more than a second because that was their first attempt and it could only give Fink and Craner the experience to refine their stories and Baldwin's performance was far more stiff than later episodes. Glow Cloud was a far leap forward for the staff, but upon critique, it didn't have everything enjoyable that I usually find in an episode. Station management was where the time spent with the previous episodes came together for a five-star experience. The episode had everything good we expect from the show. Cecil Baldwin really found a personality to act with that flourished in subtle and effective ways. Jokes like with the hooded figures and the journalism he kiosks were good. Newspaper kiosks, usually filled with important newsprint, will be filled with 2% milk. When asked why milk, the journal's publishing editor, Leanne Hart, said, It is important that we maintain an unbiased approach to news reporting. They were weird in the amusing way we are familiar with because of the show. There were government conspiracy and intern jokes. We sent our intern, Chad, to try buying a tennis racket and have not heard back from him for several weeks. This brings me to a related point. To the parents of Chad, the intern, we regret to inform you that your son was lost in the line of community radio duty and that he will be missed. One of the best traffic segments ever. Oh, wow. Well, that looks pretty good. Yep. Yes. Okay, not too bad there either, I see. Oh, that gentleman needs to slow it down. It is not a race, my friend. Not a literal one, anyway. That has been traffic. And it also happened to have one of the most memorable Carlos moments 
or if any moment in the series. Why Carlos would strip away, decimate any part of his thick black hair, not to ignore the dignified, if premature, touch of gray in the temples. What treacherous barber should agree to such depravity? Who takes mere money or even soulless joy in depriving our small community of such a simple but important act as luridly admiring Carlos's stunning quaff? But even without considering all of that, the episode still has one of the best, albeit brief, horror experiences I've ever had in the show. With Fink and Craner's style of explaining just enough without showing much more, Mystery Fuel's suspense and the skillful additions of audio make this. I'm sorry, dear listeners. We'll be back after this word from our sponsors. And this. Hello, radio audience. I come to you live from under my desk where I've dragged my microphone and I'm currently hiding in the fetal position. Did you write letters? Maybe you should not do this anymore. Station management has opened its door for the first time in my memory and is now roaming the building. This is one of the rare times I was deeply concerned for Cecil because of a sense of danger that lingered past the end of an episode. And while later episodes near the fight with Strax Corp would do this too, they just didn't sit with me like the ending of this episode. This is the first time background sound effects were combined with voiceovers to create something of this magnitude. Episodes would continue to refine the formula made in this episode in ways that sometimes are better than in station management. But this episode paved the way for most episodes to bring a lot to the table. And that's why this is the number one best episode of Welcome to Night Vale. And that's my list. Debate it or agree with it if you wish. And this is far from all the show has to offer. Some of my favorite moments aren't in these episodes. For example, Numbers has my favorite ad and I recommend checking out the whole series because the whole series has something to offer. Even the pilot has important moments that set later events in motion. And other people can probably find other things to appreciate about the series that I don't. Thank you for watching or listening. Thanks also go to anyone involved with Welcome to Night Vale. Without them, I wouldn't have this show to love as I do. I love the show. You guys are great. Keep doing what you're doing. Now if you'll excuse me, I'll continue writing some Jaws slash fiction. Then Brody put his hands around Hooper's shoulders and said, You're gonna need a bigger boat. Hooper blushed while Quint got killed with the teeth of the mighty shark. But they didn't mind, they just kissed. One last caller, you are on the air. Hi, this is Steve Carlsberg. <laughs> and uh, my question is for Hiram. Hiram! No! <laughs> no! Steve Carlsberg! We are out of time for questions, goodbye! <laughs>